So we have been talking about Z transform and we saw several properties of Z transform in the previous uh, lecture. So today we are going to talk about the important thing, which is the region of convergence. So some properties of region of convergence for Z transforms. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is right-sided signals. So these are two definitions I wanted to just cover, which we did not cover in the previous class. So right-sided signals are signals that are zero until time t, and after that it becomes non-zero. Okay, so these are right-sided signals. Then left-sided signals. They are non-zero up to some time. and then they are zero. And then there are two-sided signals that go, that, that are non-zero all the way from minus infinity to plus infinity. Okay. Let's look at the property, properties of Z transform now. So property number one, ROC is a ring centered at origin. So your ROC might look like this it might might look like this or it might look like So these are the only three different types of ROCs you will encounter uh, for Z transform of a signal. The reason for this property is as follows. Remember that the way we defined ROC, the set of all Z such that summation of Xn absolute value of Z raised to minus N is less than infinity. n goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. So this is how we defined ROC. And therefore, uh, these are always circles, concentric circles. And you take the union of those concentric circles and it becomes a ring.
Okay. Let's look at the second property. The poles do not belong to the region of convergence. And it's actually quite obvious. Um, the reason being that at poles, x of z is equal to infinity. That's the definition of a pole. The pole at pole, the z transform is actually equal to infinity or one over x of z is equal to zero. So therefore, pole cannot be part of region of convergence. Let's look at the third property. If Xn is of finite duration, then ROC is the entire Z plane, except, let me write it here. So the region of convergence for a finite duration signal is the entire Z plane, but perhaps either the origin would be missing or the infinity would be missing in the from the region of convergence. This should be and slash or infinity. Any questions so far? Let's proceed to the fourth property. Xn is right-sided signal and R0 belongs to the region of convergence. So this is my Z plane. This is my R0 and R0 is in the region of convergence. Then everything that is outside of R0 is also in the region of convergence. Everything here, it's all in the region of convergence.
the opposite property would hold in the left sided signal that's our next property um why should why should fourth be true well let's think about it so i have x of z which is summation absolute value of z raised to minus no z raised to minus n Now, if I pick a value of R, which is, and, and this is a right-sided signal. So this is actually N goes from capital T to infinity, Xn Z raised to minus N. Now I know that this is less than infinity. So if R is greater than R naught, then summation Xn R raised to minus N is also less than infinity. Anyone knows why this should be true? You must have studied it in your sequences and series, whatever Cal class can, had sequences and series. You must have studied this particular property using comparison test. Has any, do any, any of you recall that property? Let me, let me remind you what that property is. Um, so here is what you would have studied in some calc class. I don't know which class that would be. So if AK is less than or equal to BK and summation of BK summation of, well, let me say and oh, this is this, all of this is greater than zero than equal to zero. And if summation of BK is less than infinity, then summation of AK must also be less than infinity. Calc two, okay. So somebody mentioned you must have studied it in Calc two. This is called the comparison test for series. And that's exactly what you apply here to conclude the statement. Okay. Let's move on to the fifth property. Xn is left-sided signal and R0 belongs to the region of convergence, then all Z which is less than R0 are also in the region of convergence. Let me illustrate this again with a diagram. This is my Z plane. Oh, let 
this R zero is in the region of convergence, then everything inside it is also in the region of convergence. Oh, zero may not be included. Let me make a small change. Now zero may or may not be included. So that is something you need to check whether zero would be included or not. Please make this correction. So zero less than Z less than R naught also should be in the region of convergence. The proof is identical to the previous case. The only problem with zero is when you do this summation of xn r raised to minus n, and if r is equal to zero, then this n and minus n is uh, less than zero, then it creates a problem. because then R raised to minus N is infinity. Zero raised to minus N is equal to infinity. So that's why zero may or may not be part of the region of convergence. One has to check separately whether zero is part of the region of convergence or not. Let's look at the sixth property. Xn is two-sided signal. R0 is part of region of convergence. Then ROC is a ring containing circle of radius. R zero. And I want you to remember the example of V raised to absolute value of N. This example was covered in the previous class. It's a two-sided signal. And the region of convergence was a ring. In this case, the region of convergence was Z such that B is less than, Z is less than one over B. Okay. So far we have talked about general signals, signals that may or may not be exponential. Uh, all of these properties are satisfied by any discrete time signal Xn, as long as they satisfy the hypothesis, the region of convergence would satisfy the, the uh, results we just covered or the properties that we just covered. Uh, now let's talk about uh, uh, rational Z transform and whenever Xn is exponential signal, then the Z transform of Xn would be a rational function of Z. So we'll talk about the seventh property. So whenever Xn is exponential, then X of Z 
is rational. So if X of Z is rational, then ROC is bounded by poles or extends to infinity. Now let's uh, say again when uh, what it means when it's rational. Like, um... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So XZ should be summation of Z minus, uh, let me say AI. So not summation, multiplication. Multiplication Z minus BI. I equals one to N, I equals one to M. So this is a rational. Thank you. rational function of z. So whenever we say rational z transform or rational Laplace transform, this is what we mean. And the other, other thing to remember is whenever x is an exponential signal, whether it's a uh, exponentially growing, exponentially decaying, or uh, oscillating signals like cosine and sine, then they all will have a rational Z transform. So let's split this uh, rational Z transform into two types of, for two types of signals. So one is right sided signal. And the other one would be left-sided signal. Oh, I think I messed up the side. So let me keep the left-sided signal on the left side and right-sided signal on the right side. Okay, now it's, it's okay. And let's draw some poles. So these are the poles for left-sided signal and the right-sided signal. So th these are the, so in this expression, these are the poles and these are zeros. So what we have done is we have considered some arbitrary left-sided signal or right-sided signal that have rational Z transform. And what I've done is I've drawn the poles of those rational Z transform. So we know a couple of things about the region of convergence. The first thing is for left-sided signals, the region of convergence has to be close to the origin. Whereas for right-sided signals, the region of convergence has to be, has to extend all the way to infinity. So that's the first thing we know. And the second thing we know is that the poles should not be part of the region of convergence because the, uh, the Z transform at that point is infinity. So we know these two things. So that leads us to the following result. For the left-sided signal with rational Z transform, this is the pole that's closest to the origin. So I'm going to draw a circle that goes through this pole. So all the poles are outside of the circle. And my Z transform would be inside this region 
except perhaps at the origin. So I don't know whether origin is part of the uh, Z transform or not, I'll have to check. But in general, in, for the left-sided signal, you have to look at the innermost pole and then the entire circle within the innermost pole, except possibly the origin would be part of the region of convergence. So therefore, none of the poles are part of the region of convergence and it also satisfies the other property for left-sided signal we just studied. Now for the right-sided signal, we have to do the opposite because here the region of convergence has to extend all the way to infinity. So I'm going to pick the one, the farthest pole. So I think this is the farthest pole. So I'm going to draw the circle which passes through this pole and then everything outside is part of the region of convergence. Okay. <clears throat> so these are all the properties of region of convergence that we needed to know. Now we can talk about the two important properties of LTI system, causality and stability for discrete time systems in the using this concept of Z transform and the concept of region of convergence. Okay. So I have a system, LTI system. I give it a impulse input and I get an impulse output. And I define the system function or transfer function I'm going to define it by H of Z, which is summation H of N, Z raised to minus N. This would be my system function or the transfer function of the system. And of course, there will be corresponding region of convergence in which the system transfer function is well-defined. Now, there are two questions that we want to answer. Can we look at this transfer function and the region of convergence and say something about causality of the system? And the second one is, can we talk say something about the stability of the system by looking at the system transfer function or the region of convergence. And this is what we are going to talk about now. Okay, so after a lot of mathematical derivation, here is what you can actually show the two the results. It's very similar to the results we studied in the context of Laplace transform. So I'm gonna just write four results. The first result is, LTI is causal if and only if I 
ROC is exterior of a circle. Exterior of a circle and extends to infinity. So I have an LTI system. I'm, I don't know whether it's causal or not, but I look at the system transfer function and I look at the region of convergence. And if I see that the region of convergence is exterior of a circle and extends all the way to infinity, then it means that the LTI system is definitely causal system. And of course the converse also holds. Now let's consider LTI system with a rational transfer function H of Z. And this is causal if and only if there are two conditions. A, the ROC is exterior of the circle. outside the outermost pole and the order of numerator must be less than the order of denominator. So if it is rational, then the numerator is a polynomial, denominator is a polynomial, and so the degree of the highest degree of polynomial must of the numerator must be less than the highest degree of the denominator. That's the order of polynomial. Order of a numerator is less than order of denominator. So part A is, seems pretty obvious by looking at uh, some of the properties of region of convergence that we have just seen. So part A seems obvious. On the other hand, part B is required so that the region of convergence extends to infinity. In other words, if the order of numerator is greater than or equal to the order of denominator, then x of z at infinity will be equal to infinity or will be equal to constant. Should it be less than equal to or should it be uh, less than equal to, sorry. So this should be less than equal to. Let me put it in a different color. Okay, so under this condition, uh, the ROC will extend to infinity if this condition is violated, which means that the order of numerator is greater than the order of denominator. Then in that case, the region of convergence cannot contain infinity. So therefore the first condition would be violated. So therefore uh, B must also hold true for a rational HZ. So what we have learned uh, in this case is by looking at the region of convergence, it's actually easy to infer whether the LTI system is causal or not. Now we'll see that the same thing holds for stability as well. So the first result for stability, LTI is stable 
if and only if ROC contains unit circle. Okay. Let's consider the second case where I have an LTI system that is causal with a rational H of Z. So I know that it's causal and I know that H of Z is rational. Then this is stable. if and only if poles of HZ lies inside the unit circle. In other words, absolute value of poles is less than one for all poles. The second part is actually, in my personal opinion, I think this is one of the greatest results ever proved in the world. Okay, because this particular result actually, yeah, I guess, so there is a mathematics that goes behind proving this result. And that mathematics is actually uh, a very, very general tool that is available to researchers for proving convergence of a lot of different things that one studies. So for instance, I'm a, I, I, I do optimization for a living. And one of the ways for proving that whatever algorithm we develop actually converges to a solution that we are interested in uh, requires the mathematical basis of those convergence result is actually the also forms the mathematical basis for this particular result, the second result that I'm talking about. Okay, so this result has actually far reaching consequences in multiple different fields, whether it's differential equations, whether it's partial differential equations, whether it's numerical simulation, whether it's ODE solvers, or whether it's uh, you know, some other fields of mathematics and controls. So this second result is one of my favorite results of all times because of far reaching consequences that re this particular result has. I know it's very hard for you to imagine why would such a result be useful? I completely get that, but I just wanted to let you know how important this result is from the point of view of proving convergence in a large number of uh, mathematical areas. Now, of course, when you take 3551 and assuming that you talk about 
discrete time systems not always you will be talking about discrete time systems in 3551 because typically by the time you reach discrete time systems time is up for that course but uh, if you study discrete time systems in 3551 or for that matter any other course maybe 5551 you will revisit this particular result time and again for proving stability of LTI causal systems. All of these are control courses because most of the control systems are causal. Uh, this particular result is extremely useful for proving stability of uh, control systems. Any questions so far on these two results, causality and stability? Okay. Let's look at the general uh, discrete time system and the transfer function. So a general discrete time system with constant coefficient, they are given by a k y n minus k, k goes from zero to n bk xn minus k The question is, what is HZ equals to? And the answer is, would be summation BK Z raised to minus K over a k z raised to minus k. Okay, I, I want you to recall, this result was actually proven also in the context of Fourier transform chapter. So that was, I think, chapter six, maybe chapter six or five, maybe six. So that's where we showed that this particular result holds for discrete time system, but there Z was replaced with E raised to negative J, E raised to J omega. Now this holds more generally for Z transform. Let's do the derivation. Uh, let me pause here so that you can write it down and then we'll go through the derivation. Okay, so let's take the Z transform on both sides of equation one. So I have equation one, let's take Z transform on both sides of one. We will have summation AK Z raised to minus K Y of Z. Okay, now I can take the yz outside of the equation and I can take xz outside of the equation. And then I just have to bring together 
the two terms. So I can write hz equals to yz over xz. And this gives me the transfer function of the system. So that gives me the Z transform, or oh, sorry, the system transfer function, just by looking at the difference equation for an LTI system. Okay. Now the question is if this whole thing looks very similar to the Fourier transform, then why are we studying Z transform? Why not just do it with Fourier transform? And the answer that I'm going to you know, give you, and we'll just shortly see that this particular equation holds even for unstable system. Whereas in the case of Fourier transform, the system must be stable in order for us to uh, take the, Z uh, the Fourier transform on both sides of the equation and write the system transfer function. So let's look at an example. I have a system, the first order system. So this is my first order system. So if this is my system, if A is less than one, I can do H of e raised to j omega, I can compute it, and that is one over one minus a e raised to minus j omega. I can only do it for the case when a is less than one. If a is greater than or equal to one, h of e raised to j omega is undefined. This is this is all of this comes from chapter chapter six. I don't know which lecture that was. Probably lecture twenty one or twenty two. Okay, so I can't define the the h of e raised to j omega for the case when a is absolute value of A is greater than or equal to one in a first order system. Now comes uh, Z transform and I have no problems whatsoever for Z transform. I can define H of Z for the system as one over one minus AZ inverse. That would be my Z transform and the region of convergence would be Z such that absolute value of Z is greater than absolute value of A. So Z transform is well-defined and all the complexity goes into the region of convergence. Now it doesn't matter what value of A I pick. If it is less than one, greater than one, it doesn't matter to me. Um, this is the unstable system, by the way. When A is greater than or equal to one, this is unstable. But in the context of Z transform, I don't care. It could be unstable system, it could be stable system. I just have to worry about the region of convergence. Um, and as long as the region of convergence is not empty, I can study unstable system, it doesn't matter. It's not, it's not a problem within the Z transform framework. And as I've mentioned, there are a lot of unstable systems in real world that we stabilize using advanced control techniques. 
And uh, that's where this power of Z transform gets utilized because you can analyze the entire system and do the entire control design in the Z domain and then come up with an appropriate controller and implement it on actual system. The simplest example is the rocket example that I gave in the previous class or a human body example, which are simple pendulum, inverted pendulum. So therefore there are inherently unstable system. Can someone tell me, uh, so I have mentioned it several times that human body is an unstable system. We can't stand on our feet if something goes wrong with our body's control system. Can someone tell me what the, what is the major control? No, what's the, what is the sensor? that tells us that we are standing upright or we are sleeping or something like that. Does anyone know where exactly our sensors lie in our human body? There's fluid in your ears that does that. Perfect, yeah, inner ear, exactly. There's fluid in the inner ear, uh, which basically is a sensor for our body. And if, if, if there is a problem with that inner ear or the entire brain part that that processes all that information from inner ear and that fluid, uh, that's when you start falling off without like just, yeah, the, the body just cannot control itself because the information is corrupted or the computation inside the brain is corrupted. So, so it's a, it, that's the part that stabilizes our overall system, our inverted pendulum system. And the actuators in this case is our muscles, our leg muscles and our entire body, like the, uh, the, the back and the leg muscles, the, that's the actuator. And brain is like the controller and the sensor is actually some inner ear, some fluid, uh, fluid and inner ear system that senses the orientation of our body. Okay, great. Um, so that's all I wanted to cover today. Uh, on Monday, you have your quiz, so there is no class. Uh, the quiz will be in, during the class time. And then on Wednesday, I'm going to talk about block diagrams, where if you have systems that are in cascade or in parallel or in a feedback form, how do you derive the overall transfer function for the system? So I'm going to cover the, the, the actual, the result is the same for both discrete time as well as continuous time system. So I'm just going to cover everything together. And we'll see a couple of examples. And then after that, we'll start doing the review for the entire course. Um, any questions so far before we adjourn for today? Okay, no questions. So I'll see you guys on Wednesday and have a great weekend and good luck for the quiz on Monday. Thanks.